Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you Ronald Coleman in libel with Otto Pruger and Francis Robinson. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. <laughs> Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. There are probably quite a few parents in the audience with daughters who are slightly moonstruck over certain motion picture stars. And I'll offer them my sympathy right now. You see, I'm the grandfather of a certain young lady, knee-high to a grasshopper, who's very much that way about Ronald Coleman. But as a producer, not as a grandfather, I understand her admiration perfectly. In the theater of the air, the magnificent voice of Ronald Coleman is a treat that comes only once in a blue moon. So having him in the Lux Radio Theater tonight is something of an occasion. And I, I think we've got a play worthy of his talents, a powerful drama called Libel. It ran for many weeks on Broadway, and it's so, so different from the usual run of plays that I think you'll remember it for many weeks to come. Libel is the drama of a trial for libel and of a man in the pitiless glare of the courtroom who hears his life torn apart shred by shred. That man calls himself Sir Mark Loddon. But when he goes to the witness stand to try to prove that he has a right to that name, he sees the shadow of doubt cross even the face of his wife. The presence of Ronald Coleman in tonight's exciting drama would quicken the pulse of any producer, and I believe of any audience. It's what all producers pray for, and what most audiences love to pay for. But of course, our setup is different. For this is your theater, just as Lux Flakes is your product, both made expressly to please you. We prize very highly your loyalty to this theater and to our product. And anything that we tell you about Lux Flakes will be more than borne out in actual performance. Make a test if you like, and check your experience against what we say about our product. We're, we're not afraid of the answer because your letters have already told us what the results will be. There's a stir in the wings now, and our players are at the microphone as the curtain rises on the first act of Libel, starring Ronald Coleman as Sir Mark Loddon with Otto Kruger as Foxley and Francis Robinson as Lady Enid Loddon. It's 1934, just 16 years after the armistice of the First World War. In the pleasant English countryside stands the home and estate of Sir Mark Loddon, Member of Parliament. A wide drive bordered by trees leads to the front gate. There, hidden in the foliage, a man in rough clothes peers intently at the house. At last he enters the gate and moves slowly toward the door. He rings the bell, and as he waits, he seems to smile inwardly. Good morning. Morning. I'd like to see the master, if you don't mind. I'm sorry, sir, but I don't believe Sir Mark was expecting anyone. Sir Mark, is it? Will you go tell Sir Mark that Pat Buckingham is here? He'll see me. We serve together in the army, Sir Mark and I. Go on, tell him. Very well, sir. You'll wait in the library. I'll speak to Sir Mark. This way, please. Good morning. Well, hello. Did you wish to see me about something? No, 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 sir. Don't tell me you don't remember me. I'd hardly believe that, sir. I'm very sorry. Your face is familiar, but... Just uh... think a little, sir. The German prison camp at Obheim, 1918. Hobheim. Of course, you were one of the men I escaped with. That's right. There was three of us. Sir Mark Loddon, Frank Welney, and Pat Buckingham. Pat Buckingham. Yes, I remember now. Sit down, Pat. It's good to see you. Thank you. You'll have to forgive me. <laughs> My memory isn't what it used to be. How have you been, Pat? Ah, oh, pretty well. Has the world been treating you all right? Well, frankly, no. Though things are beginning to look up a bit. Fact is, I could stand the loan of a few thousand pounds. A few... A few thousand? That's right. I was in the neighborhood, so I thought I'd just drop by and see if you could help me out. You seem to be fairly well off. 
Well, yes, I am, but... Uh... So it won't be much of a loss to you, eh, Frank? Frank? Yes, Frank. Frank Wilney. Oh, I'm afraid I don't understand this. Why do you call me Frank Wilney? Because it used to be your name. What do you want to be called now? Lord Algy? Do you pretend you don't remember my name was Mark? No, 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 no. None of your blarney, Frank. I don't want to be nasty after all this time. You looked enough like poor old Mark to be his twin. I always said that. I remember joking about it the night we escaped. I said if Sir Mark got killed, Frank Welney could always go back to England in his place. And as it turned out, Sir Mark was killed. And here you are, eh, Frank? Are you mad? I am Sir Mark Lodden. Ah, oh, you now. And I say you're Frank Welney. I say you came home under his name, took his estate, and married the girl who waited for him. Get out of here. Get out. No, 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 Frank. For a few thousand pounds, say four or five, I'd be glad to get out. But under the circumstances... Get out, I tell you. You're making a mistake, Frank. You see, there's a newspaper in London that might be very glad to know what really happened to Sir Mark. Did you hear what I said? They'd pay me big for the story, even if you won't, for keeping quiet about it. Get out of this house! All right, but it don't end here. Remember that, Frank Welney. A political imposture... The legislator recently returned to the House of Commons as Sir Mark Lodden, baronet, is not a baronet, not even a lot. Mark, what is this? Now, read it, Enid. It's all there in the paper. It explains itself. But it says you're not Mark Lodden. It... No, go on. Read it. The man who is now posing as Sir Mark secured his position in Parliament by practising on the voters the same deliberate fraud that he that he practiced on his wife. Mark, this is mad. It's, it must be a joke. Yes, that's what I thought at first. But it seems it's not. Well, what are you going to do about it? I intend to sue the Gazette for malicious libel. Sue them? Well, what else can I do? I put the matter in the hands of Sir Wilfred. He's going to represent me. You're going to court? You're going to let them drag your name through a filthy mess of lies that... Mark, you can't. Enid, listen. If I could ignore this story, believe me, I would. The last thing I want to do is to risk my career, to risk my life, our life together, on anything so stupid. But they... they won't let me ignore it, Enid. You speak of a risk. What risk can there be? There are hundreds of people right here in our own village who can swear that you are Mark Lodden. That's true, but... Well, then? Well, Sir Wilfred has advised me to go through with the case, to clear my name. The Gazette is going to contend that... that I look like Sir Mark Lodden that I came home after the war and took his name and his place here, but that I am really someone else. Mark, this is horrible. How can they say such a thing? Oh, they were probably glad to get the story. They've been against me politically ever since I took office. But they must realize what it will mean to them if you bring suit. You can ruin them. If we win, of course. If you win? What doubt is there? They've printed a malicious, horrible lie. As plaintiff, we'll have to prove it a lie. I think we can. Think? Mark, I don't understand you. Enid, it's not as easy as it sounds. Not easy to prove that you are yourself. They're going to say that I'm not myself. That I look enough like Mark Ludden to fool anyone. To fool even you. To fool... To fool me? Enid, look at me. Look at me, darling. It's going to be very difficult these next few weeks. It'll need all your strength and all your courage. Mark... You frighten me. You are Mark Lodden, I know that. You're my husband, the father of my child, you are. Yes, yes, Enid, of course I am. Then why are you so worried? Oh, you were a boy in this village. You lived in this house. You were born in the East Room upstairs. There are things about this house, about the people who lived here, that only Mark Lodden would know. You can tell them they'll have to believe you then. No, Enid. They'll have to, Mark. Uh, darling, there's something I must tell you. You'll know sooner or later. You'll know in court. I want to tell you now. What is it? Do you remember when I came home after the armistice? I... I had changed, hadn't I? You'd been shell-shocked. Yes, but... Uh, but no one knew how much I had changed. Only myself. Enid, 
I had to piece my life together again. In that prison camp at Hobheim, I knew my name only from my identification disc. I <gasps> knew you only by the letters you wrote that were forwarded to me there. You say I can prove who I am by telling them things that happened here when I was a boy. I can't, Enid. I have no recollection of anything. I remember nothing that happened to me, nothing, before I was a prisoner in that camp. Enid, why do you look at me like that? Enid. You are, Mark Lawton. You are the boy I knew. You must be. You must be. Enid. You may proceed with the case for the plaintiff, Sir Wilfred. Thank you, my lord. Members of the jury, I'm not going to insult you by any further explanation of the libelous charges recently appearing in the Daily Gazette. You've seen for yourselves that the Daily Gazette has informed a million or so readers that my client, Sir Mark Lawton, is an infamous imposter in every possible role of life, public and domestic. The first witness for the plaintiff will be the plaintiff himself. Sir Mark Lawton. You swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. The evidence you shall give. The evidence I shall give. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth and nothing but the truth. The whole truth and nothing but the truth. You are Sir Mark Lawton, third baron at of Ingworth Hall in the county of Norfolk? That is so. You retired with the rank of major after 15 years' service in the rifle brigade. That's right. I believe you became engaged in 1914 to Enid, the only daughter of General Edgar Winterton, CB. Uh, we were engaged uh, just, just before the war. Yes, and after your engagement, I believe you went to France with your battalion in August 1914? Yes. Then you were wounded and taken prisoner at the Battle of the Marne. I was. What wounds did you sustain in that battle, Sir Mark? I was uh, uh, shot through both legs and badly shell-shocked. I believe the farm in which you lay wounded was set on fire by the enemy's guns and you were nearly burnt to death before you were rescued by the enemy? Very nearly. Now, what effect did that terrible experience have on you? Those few hours that afternoon... Uh, turned my hair grey, as you see it now. What was it that morning? Oh, I hadn't a grey hair. I was only 22. What happened after you were taken prisoner? I was in a German hospital for, for three months and then sent to an officer's prison camp at Hobheim. When were you released? I was never released. I, I, I escaped in October 1918. I reached the Belgian frontier three days before the armistice. Yes, and then? Then, uh... I made my way fairly easily to the English lines and was invalided home. What did you do then? I retired from the army and had a long rest cure. After oh, six months or so, I, I was as well as I suppose I ever shall be and, and married my wife. I think your son, Gerald, was born the following year. That is so. You have recently entered public life and last autumn you were elected Member of Parliament for the Raynham Division of Norfolk. Yes. Sir Mark, what is the present state of your health? Oh, subject to a bit of a limp. I, I, I can indulge in any reasonable physical effort. What about mental effort? <laughs> I suppose I mustn't say too much about that. Apart from memory, I don't complain. What of your memory? I have practically no recollection at all of, of events or persons before my imprisonment. <laughs> Now, I want to turn for the moment to the libel which is the subject of this action. Yes? The jury has heard the allegations of which you complain, Sir Mark. Is there one word of truth in them? They are an infamous lie. Has anyone else any right to your title, estates or position? Not a soul in the world. Has any member of your family at any time displayed any difficulty in identifying you? No, not one. Until this paragraph appeared in the Gazette. Ah. I think I have only one more question to put to you, Sir Mark. How did you first learn of this libelous publication? It was sent me by friends and constituents. But I first read it in my own copy of the paper. I happen to be a registered reader of the Gazette. I, uh, I don't agree with its views, but I've always liked all sorts of fiction. <laughs> Thank you, Sir Mark. That will be all. Does counsel for the defendant wish to examine the witness? We do, my lord. So, uh, you've always liked all sorts of fiction, have you? Yes. 
I said so. You've indulged that liking to a rather abnormal extent, haven't you? What do you mean? I am suggesting that ever since November 1918, you have indulged in the unscrupulous fiction of being an English baronet. That is an infamous libel for which your clients will have to pay. Of being the lawful owner of the Loudoun Estates. I am the lawful owner. Keep calm, Sir Mark. And the most unscrupulous fiction of all, of being entitled to woo and marry your wife. My wife doesn't require the protection of the gutter press. And my instructions, I'm not so sure of that. Now, uh, before we go any further, I want to be quite clear. You don't wish to suggest to the jury that any physical or mental disability at his prison or escape experiences could possibly make you believe you were someone other than yourself. Uh, do you suggest such a thing? No, I don't. Mm. You've uh, sustained no injury that could make Frank Welney honestly believe that he was Sir Mark Loddon? Of course not. Whom did you say, Mr. Foxley? Uh, Frank Welney, my lord. Who is Frank Welney? Well, if your lordship will allow me to explore that in my own way. Certainly, Mr. Foxley. Thank you, my lord. I am sure that the witness has heard of a man called Frank Welney. Certainly. He was a Canadian officer? I believe so. Did you ever know him? Yes, I, I was at the same prison camp in Germany. So I believe. Uh, for how long? Nearly four years. When did you last see him? Uh, let me see. It would be... Let uh, me help you. Did you shave yourself this morning? Yes. Uh, why? Didn't you see him then? When you looked in the mirror? I say, didn't you hear me? I'm suggesting that you are Frank Welney and that he is you. That's a lie. Is it? <laughs> we shall see. Now, uh, when did you say you saw him last? When we, 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 we escaped together in, in November 1918. We got parted. Got parted? Huh? Now, when did you get parted? We missed each other in the dark. Oh, you missed each other in the dark. Hmm. Um, is that really all you can tell me of how you separated? Yes. Well, it's very easy to get lost in the dark. The other fellows had got hold of civilian clothes, but I hadn't. I was in uniform, so we had to move by night. Is anyone else in the party of escape? Yes. A man called Buckingham. No. Then that was the party. Sir Mark Lodden, Buckingham and Welney. Yes, myself and the other two. And how did you separate? I've told you. We lost each other in the dark. Yes, and which of you got lost first? Well, Buckingham went off first to forage for food. He didn't come back. Ah, that left Lodden and Welney together. Uh, what happened then? Then Welney went off to, 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 to look for Buckingham. He never came back either. Mm, both got lost the same fatal night. Uh. Oh, killed. Ah, killed! That was it, was it? I don't know. I only mean Welney. I, I, I know Buckingham is alive. So do you. Who do you say was killed? Welney or Ludden? I won't answer that question. You know I'm alive. Yes, I know you're alive. Uh, did you make any increase at the time about your, shall we say, mislaid companion? Of course I did. And you've never heard from either of them since? Uh, not from Welney. Mm. Do you think they're dead or alive? I know Buckingham is alive. And what of Welney? I've no doubt he's dead. Uh, don't let us be unduly pessimistic. Uh, would you please describe Frank Welney's appearance to the jury? Nothing peculiar. Very ordinary-looking fellow. Oh, come, come. I, I won't... I don't want you to be so modest. Uh, was he not, in fact, remarkably like you? No. I'll put the question another way. Wasn't he remarkably like Sir Mark Ludden? I never noticed it. You never noticed it? Never. Did other people notice it? Did they? Yes. Who noticed it? Uh, Buckingham. He pretended to think that we were very much alike. Pretended? Hmm. Uh, I wonder if you remember any physical peculiarities about this man, Welney. No, I can't say that I do. No, then I shall try to help you. Thank you. I'm lucky enough to have an official description of Welney from the army, Canadian army records. Oh. Oh, I'll... most fortunate. Yes, now let's see if it helps us at all. Uh, height, five foot ten. It's about your height, isn't it? And a good many millions besides? I dare say. Uh, blue eyes, uh, what color are yours? You can see for yourself. And so can the jury. They're blue, gentlemen. Thick crop of gray hair. And uh, how would you describe yours? How would you describe yours if you'd been through what I went through? And now, even a more important physical feature of Frank Welney, it seems from this record that he had lost the first two joints of the first finger of his right hand. Had he? Yes, he had. How did you lose yours? 
My finger, do you mean? Yes. By a curious coincidence, you've also lost the first finger of your right hand. I don't know about coincidence. I'm, I'm, I'm not ashamed of my wounds. How did you lose it? My, my finger was shot off by a chance German bullet when, when I was escaping. Oh, when you were escaping. And that would produce the interesting result that no one who was at the prison camp with you could remember that Sir Mark Laden had lost a finger. Of course not. But I remember, Mr. Foxley. Would you mind holding your right hand up to the jury so that they remember too? Thank you. Quiet! Quiet, please! Now, I'm going to read one thing more from this official record of the unfortunate Frank Welney. It has the initials F.W. tattooed on his right forearm in a red and blue circle. Had he? Yes, now I come to think of it, I remember he was tattooed. Ah, and I wonder if you would mind showing Millard and the jury your forearm. And what is your suggestion? I'm glad to make it clear. I definitely suggest your right forearm has the letters F.W. tattooed on it. I don't want to conceal anything. I'm, I'm quite prepared to admit my arm is tattooed and has some letters on it, but not those. Uh, may we see for ourselves what they are? Certainly. Thank you. Uh, would you show your arm to my lord and the jury? As far as I can see, the initials tattooed on the plaintiff's arm are E.W. in a red and blue circle. That is so, my lord. But I suggest those letters, E.W., were originally F.W. for Frank Welney. It would only require the addition of a single stroke. Would it not? Hmm. Very true. Yes, uh, perhaps the witness can explain those letters. Uh, what about the E? If you must have it, E is my wife's initial. Her name is Enid. Indeed, yes. Uh, but if the letter was originally F, that explanation would not do. No. But as it never was, there is no difficulty. Ah, and uh, what is the W for? Uh, the W... Uh, the... The W stands for her maiden name, uh, Winterton. And uh, when did you have them tattooed? In Hobheim camp, by a fellow prisoner. Why? To pass the time. Time goes rather slowly in a prison camp. I dare say. Uh, did they permit you to write letters? Yes, they did. Can you produce any letters written by Sir Mark Laden while he was a prisoner? No, I cannot. Ah, fortunately, I can. I have here some specimens of Sir Mark's pre-war and prison handwriting and your post-war handwriting. Will you look at them? Well? Uh, they're rather different, aren't they? Shoot off your first finger and see if your handwriting is did the same. Did you shoot yours off? No, I did not. No, it was a chance bullet, of course. <laughs> and it all comes down to this, doesn't it? That Frank Welney had lost the first finger of his right hand and you have lost yours. Frank Welney had the letters F.W., tattooed in his right forearm before captivity, and Sir Mark Lodd and the English Berriment had E.W., almost the same letters, tattooed on the same arm during his captivity. It's a world of coincidences, isn't it? Yes, yes, it seems to be. Yes, doesn't it? All of the physical features, which were wellness, are also yours. Can you produce one physical characteristic which would identify you as Mark Lodd? No. Not even a mark or a scar from your boyhood. I told the court I don't remember my boyhood. No, you were shell-shocked. A very convenient explanation. It also happens to be the truth. I didn't want to lose all the memories of my youth. Here I am, a man of 40, over 40, and for all practical purposes, my life began 15 years ago. And a very nice life it was, Mr. Welney. I am Sir Mark Lodden. That is the question we are here to decide. If I am not Mark Lodden, what became of him? Hmm. Shall I tell you? Mark Lodden is dead. Mark Laden was murdered by Frank Wellner. And you are Frank Wellner. <laughs> and so the curtain falls on Act One of Libo, starring Ronald Coleman with Otto Kruger and Francis Robinson. In a moment, Mr. DeMille brings you Act Two. Meantime, let's take an imaginary trip from coast to coast. Listen. San Francisco. Chicago. Philadelphia. New Orleans. 
Now that's a glimpse of the kind of thing that happened when an impartial survey was made in cities all over the country. Doorbells were rung and thousands of women were asked questions like this. Would you tell me, please, what soap you use for stockings? Why, Lux Flakes, of course. Then the same question was asked about other nice things. And in thousands of homes, east, west, north, and south, the answer was Lux. Finally, when all the interviews were read and tabulated, it was found that... All over the United States, it's new Quick Lux Flakes two to one. Right. Twice as many women use new Quick Lux Flakes for stockings, underthings, and other nice things as use any other flakes, chips, or beads. Now, that's a vote of confidence, isn't it? No wonder women are crazy about new Quick Lux, Mr. Ruick. Yes, it's so fast. Why, in water as cool as your hand, it's three times as fast as any of ten other leading soaps tested. And that's a big help when you're busy, Mr. Ruick. It saves time. And new Quick Lux flakes are so gentle, safe for anything safe in water. And that saves stockings and other nice things. And new Quick Lux is thrifty to use, too, because a little goes so far. No wonder it's America's favorite way of washing all kinds of nice things. Why not get a generous big box tomorrow and give your stockings under things, your washable dresses and blouses, your gloves and sweaters, this fast, thrifty, safe care. New Quick Lux comes in the same familiar package, and it doesn't cost you a cent more. Now, your producer, Mr. DeMille. Act two of Libel, starring Ronald Coleman as Sir Mark Laden, with Otto Kruger as Foxley and Francis Robinson as Lady Enid. <laughs> the second day of the trial. An hour before court is to reopen, the man known as Sir Mark Laden confers with his counsel. Sir Mark's face is white and drawn, his eyes bright and feverish. Restlessly, he paces the library as he speaks. Oh, it's not for myself that I mind, it's, it's for Enid. I watched her yesterday in court. She was so bewildered and hurt. If only there was some way of sparing her. We had to bring the suit, Mark. It was the only thing to do. I realize that. You've said it 20 times. Mark. I'm sorry, Sir Wilfred. My nerves are all on edge. Did you sleep last night? How could I sleep? I went over every word of the trial, hour by hour. You should have tried to rest. We have a hard day ahead of us. Could it possibly be any harder than yesterday? What'll they do? Put Buckingham on the stand first, I imagine. After that, I don't know. Buckingham. There's a witness for you. I think I can take care of Buckingham. Mark. Why didn't you tell me about those tat tattoo marks? The letters E.W. on your arm, why didn't you tell me? Well, I... I didn't think it was important. Yet you knew that Wellney had almost the same letters on his arm. The inference that F might have been changed to E was something that I should have been prepared for. And I didn't tell you. Am I supposed to remember every minor detail of something that happened 16 years ago? That minor detail, as you call it, may prove very damaging. If I'm to represent you, Mark, you must not withhold anything that may have a bearing on the case. Withhold? Why should I withhold anything from you? I don't know, Mark. You're, you're, you're beginning to talk like Foxley. Don't, don't you believe me either? I'm only trying to look at this through the eyes of the jury. That's my job, Mark. And in the eyes of the jury, I am an imposter and a murderer. Is that what you mean? I mean that minor details can sometimes blind a jury to the truth. We must be careful, Mark. Very careful. Oh, Enid. Come in, dear. I didn't want to disturb you, but we haven't much time. Enid. Do you think it's wise for you to come to court? I must be there, Mark. But it's horrible for you listening to all that. It is horrible. That's why I can't stay away. I must be near you. You're my husband. Enid, darling, you say that as if... Please, Mark, not now. There isn't much time to talk now. All right, darling. <laughs> Now, uh, Mr. Bucknam, uh, let's get on to October 1918. Uh, what happened then? Our guards were reduced, so we tried to escape. And who were we? Loden, Welney and me. We got off all right at the first attempt and trekked towards the Belgian frontier, moving at night. Go on. A few days before the armistice, we reached the outskirts of a small town, Stavolo, just over the frontier by Malmedy. What happened then? Well, it was my turn to forage for food. I went off and left the other two in the wood about a half a mile up the hill outside the town. When I got back, Wellney had done a bunk. Done a bunk? 
he disappeared. Only Loden was there, and he... Yes, yes, what happened? Well, I don't suppose we'll ever know the exact truth. Will you tell the jury what you saw? I saw poor old Mark Loden where I'd left them both. He was lying on the ground with his head bashed in. Any signs of a struggle? Rather. Loden's clothes were more red than khaki. His arm had been smashed to a pulp. Which arm? His right arm. He was smothered in blood. Face and arms. Mm. And you say there was no trace of Welney? Not a sign. What did you do? I saw poor old Mark was dead, but I couldn't leave him there. So I lifted him as well as I could and took him along to the door of the first big house, left him on the step and ran away. But you're sure that Sir Mark was dead? As dead as mutton. Thank you, Mr. Buckingham. Your witness, Sir Wilfred. Mr. Buckingham, am I right in assuming that your suggestion is that Frank Welney murdered Sir Mark Lawden? Of course he did. I left them together. What time was that? About eight or nine o'clock. Was it dark? It was dark. I've told you so. Then how can you be so sure it was poor old Mark and not Welney that you carried? No. His face was smothered in blood. No doubt about it. If I hadn't known his shape when I carried him, I'd have known his uniform. He was the only one of the party in uniform. I see. Now tell me, Mr. Buckingham... It's some years since you were demobilized. It is. And where have you lived during those years? Ah, uh, different places. I wonder if I can guess some of them. Did you spend nine months in Liverpool jail? Yes, I did. What for? Is that important? Very important. Well, it was a misunderstanding, that's all. Really? And then did you spend 18 months in Newcastle? Yes. In prison again? Well, what was that for? Same sort of thing. I was just... Wasn't it for blackmail? Something of that sort. Blackmail. Then did you get three years in the Old Bailey? Yes. Another misunderstanding. Yes, eh? it was. Blackmail again. Some people might describe you as a professional blackmailer. Then some people would be wrong. We'll let the jury decide that. Your witness, Mr. Foxley. Mm. You have served several terms of imprisonment. Yes. For fraud and blackmail. Well, yes, I can't deny it. Have you ever been charged with murder? No. Or attempted murder? No. And of what do you accuse the plaintiff? Of murdering Mark Lawden and slipping into his shoes. That's all. Witness excuse. Well. <laughs> and uh, now, my lord, I should like to ask for a short recess. Recess at this time? If it please, your lordship, it is most necessary I would not ask it. The most important witness in this case will arrive here within the hour. <laughs> He must be a very important witness, Mr. Foxley. You've had time to prepare this case. Why wasn't the witness summoned in time? He was, my lord. It took some time to prepare for the journey. This witness is coming from the village of Stavelo on the Belgian frontier. Sir Wilfred, what is this? What are they going to do? I don't know. You'd better leave the court, Mark. Go to that little restaurant around the corner. I'll try to meet you there in ten minutes. Another cup of tea, sir? No, 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 thank you, no. Nothing wrong with it, is there, sir? No, no, it's just I, I don't want any more, please. Very well, sir. Mark! Mark! Sir Wilfred, I thought you'd never come. Sit down. Well? Well, I found out who it is. The witness? Who? It's a man named Flordon, a doctor. A doctor? Listen, Mark, that body that Buckingham left at the door in Stavlow... Yes? Dr. Flordon discovered it that night. Let's go on. He took it into the hospital and... Whoever it was, Mark, that man is still alive. What? He can't be. Mark. He's dead, I tell you. That man is dead. He must be dead. Mark, what are you saying? What do you know about this man? I, I, I know nothing, nothing. Pull yourself together, Mark. Yes, of course, I, I'm all right now. <laughs> And you say, Dr. Flordon, that you practice as a doctor of medicine in the town of Stavlo on the old Belgian frontier? Yes, monsieur, for more than 20 years at the so. And you were there 1918? I was. Do you remember something which happened two days before the armistice? It comes back to me distinctly. A boy summoned me to at midnight to a farmhouse near the town. There on the doorstep lay a man in a very old English uniform. I knelt down... I felt the pulse, the heart. The man was not quite dead, but so nearly a corpse has made no difference. Uh, what did you do? There was no hope for recovery. 
But I determined to do my best. I dressed his wounds at the farm and the next morning had him removed to my hospital for mental cases. And then? Gradually, a miracle occurred. Sometimes it so happens. One life is cut short and another is spared. Sometimes a life that means nothing, less than nothing. Uh, uh, let's get on, please. What happened as a result of your treatment? As I have told you, it was a miracle. My poor unfortunate recovered completely in a physical sense. But the appalling concussion of the blows which so nearly killed him has deprived him of all intelligence. Deprived him of intelligence? Now, what do you mean? Uh, can he speak? I cannot say. He has a tongue. He has not ever used it. He cannot understand a word written or spoken, English or French. He uh, cannot think. Really? How can you say that? Because I, Emile Flordon, have studied these things and know. He is a living log. No more. And he has been an inmate in your mental hospital ever since the night you found him? Yes. We call him number 15. Number 15? Why? What other name could we give him? We knew him not. And that has ever since been the number of his cell. I believe that you can produce one or two exhibits associated with this sad case. Yes. This is the khaki jacket number 15 was wearing at the time. You see how it is stained with torrents of blood. It has lost the right sleeve. It is unfortunate. I had to cut that off to examine the arm. It could not be helped. Uh, my lord, members of the jury, please notice that this jacket is of the type worn by officers of the Rifle Brigade. Sir Mark Laden was a captain in the Rifle Brigade. Uh, now, doctor, can you produce anything else? Yes. I have brought with me another exhibit from Belgium. Number 15 himself. Number 15? Yes, my lord. That so unfortunate body was out of brain. Uh, may my assistant bring him in? He is, of course, in a wheelchair. Oh, I'm sure my lord will allow it. Let him come in. Bring in number 15. <laughs> this, my lord, is number 15. <laughs> from the court. You will notice, my lord, that the features are unrecognizable. Uh, bring him closer, please. Thank you. You will also notice that he breathes with great difficulty. The bone structure of the head was badly smashed. With some heavy instrument? Very heavy. Possibly the butt of an army rifle. I see. Uh, now, Dr. Fordon, uh, there is a very important question in this case. Uh, yes, monsieur? It is whether... The real name of this poor man here is Welney, or whether his real name is Sir Mark Ludden. That is indeed an interesting question. And poor number 15, he does not know, he cannot tell. It would obviously be useless to question him. Useless indeed, monsieur. Uh, nevertheless, with my lord's permission, I should like to establish that this, uh, this man is incapable of knowing who he is. You have my permission, you may question him. Number 15. Do you hear me? Number 15. Do you know your name? It is no use, monsieur. Please, please. Number 15. Look at me. Look. Here, here. Turn his head this way. Thank you. Uh, let, look at me. Now try to think. Try to remember. Have you ever heard of a man called Sir Mark Ludden? Stop it! Stop it! Let him alone! Let him alone! Mark, be quiet! Don't you see what they've done? They've brought a dead man here. I can't stand it. I can't look at him. No, because you can't bear to see the result of your handiwork. He's not alive. Look at his face. Yes, look at it! Mark, he's don't. a corpse. He's been dead for 15 years. Take him back to his grave. Let him rest. Let him rest. My lord, a recess, please. Sir Mark has collapsed. After a short intermission, Mr. DeMille and our stars, Ronald Coleman, Otto Kruger, and Francis Robinson, return in Act Three of Libel. 
Now, a question to the women in our audience. When you want to know the best way to care for something that you've bought, what do you do? If you can, you ask the person who made it, don't you? Well, take leather gloves, for example. Nowadays, beautiful gloves are being designed and made here in America. And in a practical American way, more and more of them are washable. Now, that's a great convenience and a great saving of cleaning bills. But of course, you want to know how to wash them safely. If not washed properly, they may come out stiff and shrunken. Well, here's advice from the experts. The National Association of Leather Glove Manufacturers, whose members are the people who make leather gloves. Will you read what they say, Sally? They say, never use a strong soap because harsh alkali can rob the fine leathers of their oils, leave them dry and stiff. Never rub with a cake soap either because this may spoil the finish. We recommend new Quick Lux Flakes. Now that's expert advice, and it's sound, because new Quick Lux has no harmful alkali, and with the instant rich Lux suds, you don't need to rub. Maybe our audience would like some tips about glove washing, Mr. Ruick. I think that's a good idea, Sally. Well, here they are. Wash chamois and doe skin off the hands, all other leathers on the hands. Use cool Lux suds and press the suds gently into the gloves. Rinse in cool water, and for a last rinse, use some fresh, light Lux suds. Squeeze out the moisture in a towel. When partly dry, work the leather between your fingers. It will come out soft as new. Thank you, Sally. And remember, the American craftsmen who make the lovely gloves now on sale in stores want you to get splendid wear. Follow the advice of the National Association of Leather Glove Manufacturers. Use gentle, new, quick Lux flakes for all washable gloves. We pause now for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Curtain rises on the third act of Libel. The third day of the trial, with the evidence mounting against the man called Laden, Sir Wilfred in desperation put Lady Laden on the stand, but her testimony lacked conviction, and now the opposing counsel is cross-examining. And uh, your husband was married to you? As Sir Mark Lodden. Yes. Now, uh, uh, only a few more questions from me, Lady Lodden. Uh, did Mark Lodden ever write to you from captivity? At regular intervals after the first two months. Hmm. I want you to search your memory most carefully. Did any of those letters reveal to you any uh, loss of pre-war memories? I... No. He said nothing of it. He asked me to wait for him. And you did? Yes. Uh, I waited. Uh, did he ever complain in those letters of shell shock? He never complained of anything. Hmm. Uh, one final question, Lady Lawton. Do you now believe your husband, the plaintiff in this action, is really Mark Lawton? Well, is he or is he not Sir Mark Lawton? I don't know. I don't know! I don't know! Well, Sir Wilfred, have you decided to adopt any particular course? Is this case to go to the jury? Our position, my lord, is very difficult. But I fear I must yield to my client's insistent desire that I should exercise the right your lordship reserved to me. The right to recall the plaintiff on the question of the uniform jacket which was produced by Dr. Flordon yesterday. I believe I did reserve that. Your client has the right to give his evidence on that one point. Sir Mark, will you go into the witness box, please? He seems to be under great strain. He can, if he likes, give his evidence sitting down. Thank you, my lord. Sir Mark, you had an opportunity yesterday of seeing the uniform jacket produced by Dr. Flordon? Yes. You admit it's a rifle brigade jacket? Well, most certainly. I have no doubt... That jacket was mine. Silence! Silence! You identify the jacket as yours? Oh, yes, my lord. 
Do you mean your uniform was on number 15 when he was found by Dr. Flaudon? I do. I should very much like to know why. We are coming to that, my lord. Will you tell the court, Sir Mark, how your jacket came to be on number 15? Yes, well, you see, uh, Buckingham was speaking the truth when he said he went foraging that night, leaving uh, uh, Wellney and me together. He was away a very long time. We thought, we, we, we thought he, he'd been caught. So Wellney went to look for him. When neither Wellney nor Buckingham came back, I, I began to creep along the edge of the wood towards the town. Suddenly, I, I bumped into a German soldier. He was as frightened as I was. Without a word, he fired off his rifle before he'd put it to his shoulder. The bullet hit my hand, and, and, and that's when I lost my finger. Yes, what happened then? I dashed in and, and wrenched the rifle out of the man's hands. He put up his arm to save himself, and I, I brought the, the butt down on his head. He dropped like a stone. It, it was horrible. Go on, go on. Then, then I suddenly realized where I stood. I'd lost my two companions. I felt sure they'd been caught. And on top of that, I'd killed a German soldier, and that meant... That meant certain death if they found me. The only chance of getting through was to get out of my uniform and get into a German one. So I changed with the man I... I thought I had killed. Of course, I took everything out of my own pockets. If I hadn't made the change, I'd never have got through. Never! Is there um, anything else you wish to add, Sir Mark? Uh... Only this. Unless someone changed the uniform again after I got away, that poor devil whom Dr. Flaudon saved is not an Englishman at all. He is that German soldier. That will be all, Sir Mark. Mr. Foxley? Thank you. Uh, tell me, uh, uh, witness, are you sure that you're fit for cross-examination? Uh, whatever view the jury may take, there's no doubt you've had a great shock. Yes, I've had a great shock. Yet in some ways I feel fitter to answer your questions than I was two days ago. No, no, what does that mean? That shock seems to have brought a few things back to me. I believe I might be able to tell you a bit more now of pre-war events than I could then. Very interesting. Hmm. Uh, when you first gave evidence, did I hear you take the oath? Of course. To tell the truth, the whole truth? Yes. Then why didn't you tell the whole truth? I thought I did. Thought you did. Why didn't we hear a word of this encounter with a German soldier? I, 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 I didn't think it mattered. Oh, didn't think it mattered. And if it was true, why suppress it? Can't you see it was only yesterday that I knew that that poor devil was still alive? Whether I'm Frank Wellney or not had nothing to do with that German soldier until you produced that jacket. Oh, and uh, when did you first tell this story to anyone? Uh, this morning, to Sir Wilfred. Ah, did you never tell your wife? No. And why not? I, I didn't want her to associate me with that sort of thing. What sort of thing? I've told you the way I killed him. I have a note of what you said. I brought the butt down on his head. He dropped like a stone. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Is that all the truth? Have we got it all even now? No, no, not all, not all. I'll tell you. He, he gave a dreadful scream and fell down. Helpless. I had to finish him off. I had to. If I was to have a chance of getting away, getting home, seeing... Take your time, Sir Mark. How many more blows? How can I tell? I've tried to forget all these years. I can't think of it even now. So uh, we seem to be right. You are a man capable of brutal murder. Did you ever serve in the war, Mr. Foxley? Learned counsel do not expose themselves to questions when they're cross-examining. I don't want his answer. If he can't see the difference between murdering a fellow captive and killing an enemy soldier who has fired on yes, you... Yes, yes, yes. Well, let's uh, not get off the subject, please. Can you produce a shred of evidence that would substantiate this story? No. No, it, it depends on my word. Mm, with nothing to support it. And uh, what became of the German uniform you say you escaped in? I, I burnt it. I wanted to forget. Th that seems unfortunate. It might have given the name or regimental number of your mythical German. Ah, I, I can give you the poor devil's name and regimental number. Never mind the number. Perhaps I can tell you the name. Wasn't it Mark Ludden? No, it was not. My lord, it doesn't appear to interest my learned friend, but I'm sure it will interest the jury. Sir so Mark, I want you to tell the court the name of that German soldier. It was Karl Geist. Karl Geist? 
Are you certain of that name? Yes, my lord. How? Here it is on his identity disc. Let me see it. Here, my lord. Hmm. You swear this was on the body of the German soldier whose uniform you exchanged for your own that night at Stavlow? I do. And you've kept it all these years? Uh, yes, my lord. Has anyone beside yourself ever known of the retention? No, my lord. I, I've kept it locked up. It seems to me it becomes increasingly difficult for a jury to give a verdict in this case. My lord, I only want the verdict of the jury for the sake of one person, and that is my son. I've already lost the only verdict I wanted for myself. No, no, Mark. I believe you. I do. I believe you, Mark. Silence! Silence! Has the witness anything more to say? My lord. Yes? Something has just come back to me. And what is it? May I look at my jacket? Certainly. Uh, pass the jacket to the plaintiff. Well? Will, will someone lend me a knife? A knife? What I, for? I want to cut something I sewed in the back of my breast pocket. Something you sewed in? Two fifty mark notes and... I don't and... know that we can let you mutilate an exhibit. Oh, my lord, I, I've admitted it's my jacket. And you can see where I sewed it up. Where you sewed it? You sewed something in the lining? Yes, my lord. When did you do that? Oh, when I was at Hubheim. If I might have a knife to cut these stitches. Uh, you may. Uh, who has a pocket knife? Sure, my lord. Give it to the witness. Thank you. Before I started to escape from Hubheim with Welney and Buckingham, I wasn't too sure of my companions or what might happen to things in my pockets. <laughs> I don't seem to have been far wrong. So I sewed inside the lining of this breast pocket a photograph and two fifty-mark notes. If this is my jacket, they should be here now. Well, cut it. Cut the lining. Yes, yes, of course, yes. Here. Here. Well? Here are the notes. And here is the photograph. May I see the photograph, Sir Mark? It was taken many years ago, but I, I suppose you can recognize it. It all begins to come back to me, my lord. This is the first photograph my wife gave me when we were engaged. I took it with me to France. I always had it in that pocket. I see something is written on it. To darling... Uh, need that to be read aloud, my lord? I think it should. Members of the jury, on this photograph, these words are written. To darling Mark, with all my love, Enid. With all my love. Mark! Um, my lord. Yes, Mr. Foxley? My lord, my client has made a great mistake. We are more than sorry for the great trouble we have caused. This man is obviously Sir Mark Ludden. My darling, I'm so ashamed. Can you ever forgive me? You didn't know. I hardly knew myself at times. Oh, Mark, you're so tired. Will you come home with me, Mark? Will you? Enid. Sir Mark. Yes, my lord? Sir Mark, before you leave, may I hope that something more than a name has been recovered by this trial? Uh, my lord? I cannot believe that the merciful providence which allowed Sir Mark and Lady Lawton to come together after all the dangers of the war will not again avail to bring them through this final tribulation. My lord, you may rest assured on that point. My wife and I are going home. In just a moment, Mr. DeMille brings back Ronald Coleman for a curtain call. Some people call men the logical sex, say that women go by intuition, not reason. Well, I think women are logical, and I'll tell you why. For a long time, we've been giving them good reasons for using new Quick Lux Flakes for dishes. Now, we're sure that they are acting on those reasons because more and more they are using new Quick Lux for their dishes. The reason for doing this is simple. There is a great difference between harsh soaps and gentle Lux Flakes. New Quick Lux contains no harmful alkali, nothing to irritate the skin, nothing to leave it coarse, rough, dry. That's why, in hundreds of dramatic one-hand tests, Lux proved so much kinder to hands. These tests, as I've told you, were absolutely impartial, made by a well-known scientific laboratory. 
they included five soaps widely used for dishes. In the tests, each woman dipped one hand in Lux suds, the other in suds from a different soap. The Lux hands remained amazingly soft, smooth, and lovely, while the other hands became distressingly red and rough. Now you can easily prove this difference in your own dishpan. If you've been using a harsh soap, just change to new quick Lux for your dishes. You'll see the difference in your hands very soon. It's such an inexpensive way to have soft, lovely hands in spite of dishwashing. Get the generous big box of Lux Flakes tomorrow and start using it right away. Now, here's Mr. DeMille with our star. I've known our star and admired his art for a good many years. I think tonight's performance was one of the finest he's ever given. As he comes back to our microphone now, we take our hats off to Ronald Coleman. Oh, my thanks to you, C.B., and to Otto Kruger and Francis Robinson for their fine performances. I'm very proud to be a member of your company this week. Each time I've come here, you've surpassed your reputation as a host. <laughs> Our only complaint, Ronnie, is that you, you don't come often enough. As one sailor to another, C.B., don't go overboard. I might wear out my welcome. <laughs> we'll take a chance on that. Right now, Ronnie, I've received instructions from a good many of our audience to get a firm answer from you to a certain question. Well, I've been on the stand most of the evening. One more can't hurt. <laughs> the suggestion is that you pin down all the rumors and tell us uh, what your next picture is going to be. It'll be with RKO, and at the moment, it's My Life with Caroline. Though before we get through, it may have another title. <laughs> now, I've, I have a question for you, CB. You may fire when ready, Ronnie. Well, it's about another picture, Land of Liberty the film which you edited and assembled for the entire motion picture industry. I understand it's going to be released very soon. Yes, on January 24th, to be exact. You see, Land of Liberty was made originally for the two world fairs as a kind of story of America in motion pictures. It has literally dozens of stars in scenes taken from 112 different motion pictures and many newsreels. But a great many people didn't, didn't get a chance to see it at the fairs. So now it's going to be shown in theaters throughout the country because of the nature of the picture and its timeliness as a living saga of our country. All the proceeds are being given to charity. So I have no hesitation in recommending Land of Liberty to every loyal American. It's a great subject and it's for a great cause, C.B. And I know the whole country is looking forward to seeing it. Now I think the audience is anxious to hear about your play for next week. Mm -hmm. And it's something to tell the world about, Ronnie. Next Monday night, we're going to have... Merle Oberon and Jean Autry in The Cowboy and the Lady. It'll be Jean's first appearance in the Lux Radio Theater, but he'll be right at home in the part of a reckless and romantic buckaroo. And you'll hear Merle Oberon in the same role she played in the Samuel Goldwyn picture, The Cowboy and the Lady. And I, for one, won't miss it. Good night. <laughs> Good night, Ronnie. Good night. That applause is your second verdict tonight. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Gene Autry and Merle Oberon in The Cowboy and the Lady. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. Francis Robinson is currently seen in the Columbia picture, So You Won't Talk. Heard in tonight's play were Vernon Steele as Sir Wilfred, Alec Harford as Buckingham, Jeff Corey as Dr. Flaudon, Eric Snowden as Judge, Jack Lewis as his associate, Noreen Gamil as Waitress, and Lou Merrill as Miles. Our music is directed by Louis Silvers. Our Lux Radio Theater production of Libel has come to you with the good wishes of the makers of new Quick Lux Flakes, the tissue-thin soap flakes used by smart housewives everywhere and by the great motion picture studios to protect the million-dollar wardrobes that you see on the screen. Join us again next week. Be part of the coast-to-coast -coast audience that gathers each week to enjoy this hour of dramatic entertainment. This is your announcer, Melville Ruick, bidding you good night. And this is the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>